Hello and welcome to All Aboard TII's Accessibility Podcast. This is a podcast about accessibility and sustainable public transport, brought to you by Transport Infrastructure Ireland. I'm Claire Scott and I'm joined by our All Aboard podcast host, Sarah O'Donnell. Throughout the series, we'd be hearing first-hand accounts from people who use and design public transport systems, and specifically the role accessibility plays in these experiences. And who is this podcast for? In the first instance, we hope to connect with people with disabilities who use our services. But also, it's for anyone who is drawn to human interest stories and has a curiosity to learn more. And of course, we hope to attract listeners who are designers and decision makers for transport systems, who through the podcast might get a better understanding of some of the problems and potential solutions that are out there. So without further ado, let's give this a go and get all aboard TII's Accessibility Podcast. Hi, Sarah. So what's the theme of this episode? Hi, Claire. So the theme for this episode is Hidden Disabilities. We talk firstly to the brilliant Emily Larkin, campaigner and founder of Invisible Disability Ireland. And then later in the programme, we have an in-depth conversation with Emer Dennehy, archaeologist with TII, about her life following a car accident. So we're joined by Emily Larkin, founder of Invisible Disability Ireland. Emily, you're very welcome to All Aboard TII's Accessibility Podcast. So you founded Invisible Disability Ireland in 2019. So maybe if you could start by telling us about the organisation itself and a little bit about uh, how you came to set it up. Yeah, it was actually set up when I looked up Invisible Disability Charities in Ireland and there wasn't any. And I was really shocked because, you know, as someone who who has had invisible disabilities quite a long time, it kind of clicked into place that that was why there wasn't the awareness and the understanding around it was because there was no kind of organization advocating and explaining it. Yeah. So I set it up actually as part of uh, Goshka, the President's Award, as part of my voluntary um, work that I was meant to do. Um, and then it just kind of blossomed from there. I set it up as a page originally, and then it just kept uh, growing and growing and growing, which was really, really great to see um, and to sit back and watch it expand that way and then it was all just about and it still is about just raising awareness on invisible disabilities and what it means and what it looks like Mm -hmm. and just challenging the narrative around disability in general because we have quite a one-dimensional perception that maybe we we think disability is a certain way and it's actually pulling back on that taking a look, opening it up and yeah. digging a bit deeper on what it actually means to live with a disability. Because um, the statistic goes 80% of all disabilities are invisible. So that's a massive proportion of the disabled population who are underrepresented. underrepresented. So it's all just about making sure that we're getting the message across and we're encouraging and helping people as much as possible. Very good. And I saw that on your website, Invisible Disabilities uh, Ireland.com that you have a page with uh, testimonies and stories from people and it really kind of shows the kind of diverse range of of hidden disabilities so maybe for people who wouldn't be aware like what what would you know what's the kind of broad spectrum of what what is hidden disabilities you know it's exactly that. It's a, it's a spectrum. So you have people with mild, moderate, severe. You know, you have people with visual impairments, with um, an intellectual disability, with a physical disability, with chronic illness. It's so broad and diverse. And I think that's one thing we really underestimate or don't see a lot of the time because a lot of those conditions are, are hidden. Um, so someone with dyslexia or depression or fibromyalgia, you wouldn't see that. So I think it's very it's very much opening up people's eyes and showing how incredibly diverse the community is um, and disability looks like different things for different people. Two people can have the same disabilities and have completely different experiences and symptoms. So I think it's always important to to highlight that although we have similar experiences, they're not all the same. The same yeah. yeah. And in terms of kind of feedback that you're hearing, um, like how, from the very fact that these disabilities are hidden or, you know, mm-hmm. that. Uh, how is that then manifesting in kind of negative ways, first of all, say on public transport or in society generally? Like- yeah, I think transport is one of the areas that is a massive barrier. You know, people have to get to hospital appointments. People have to go to, you know, 
school to access education they have to go to all work to access employment so transport does kind of underpin a lot of those rights um, that people with disabilities need access to and I think there's been a lot of brilliant work done over the years but I think maybe where we fell down was hidden hidden disabilities yeah and I commuted to college for four years so it wasn't to turn the bus out again and it really opened up my eyes to how sometimes it's just not accessible for people with hidden conditions and I and, and there were moments where I really really did struggle um accessing transport and mm-hmm. that's kind of where I know we'll talk about it a bit later but the campaign for please offer me a seat came from yeah and was that a uh, campaign initiated through Invisible Disabilities yeah. Ireland? Okay. I always say it started with one email, one very simple email. I, I emailed them off the cuff and said, listen, you know, I work for Invisible Disability Ireland and I have a hidden condition and I'm really struggling with um, public transport because I used to commute during rush hour and as we know, you know, the buses are crammed, you're waiting a long time, you're standing for up to an hour, whatever it is. And so it was really difficult for me with someone with a hidden condition, mine being, you know, rheumatoid arthritis and fibromyalgia, I look perfectly healthy and normal. So, you know, it was very awkward kind of maybe sitting in the high priority seating area and people kind of giving you funny looks yeah. and you feeling guilty. And it was such a perpetual cycle of, of all of those things. So I emailed them and said, listen, there was a pilot scheme done for Transport for London a few years ago. Mm-hmm. And it's a blue badge and it was the please offer me a seat. And I said, you know, would you be interested in this being replicated in Ireland? And then I got the email back a few days later and they were they were all on board. They Excellent. were. <laughs> and that came <laughs> from thrilled. the National Transport Authority. Yeah, that was, was the, the NTA. NTA. Yeah. So they were brilliant. Yeah. Brilliant. And do you find then in practice that people are starting to slowly become more aware of it and that it has a positive effect uh, actually like on, on the bus or? Yeah, like my friends have seen the badges and stuff and they're like, they always text so proud, me. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and I was part of the campaign. So my face was on the posters and it was really cool. I was on the dart the other day and like seeing the posters, it's like, wow, <laughs> you know, that's so cool. Yeah. Like it's something so small, but you know, if someone's bored on the dart and they're looking and they say hidden disability, okay. And you know, it gets them thinking. So even just 10 seconds looking at that poster, They've thought about, about something it, yeah. they maybe haven't thought about before. And then the badge just brings so much help and understanding. And people go, oh, oh yeah, I never thought about it like that. Ge- yeah. You know, generally when I, when I open up the conversation, people are always very open about it. And they say, well, actually, I've never really thought about it like that before. And people are very open and understanding to it, which is which is brilliant. brilliant. So it's just a matter of providing that education and understanding and support. Yeah. And of course, it's kind of the more it's used the more people become aware exactly. of it and the you know the better it's applied yeah and then just for people who mightn't be aware how does it compare to the just a minute card the jam card and the yeah so a jam card is for people maybe with um maybe intellectual disabilities or um you know there's lots of different reasons why people use them they might get flustered or they might need just a moment so that's what it's for it's just a minute and it gives people that time if they maybe have a language barrier or if they're feeling you know, flustered or they can't find something and they need to just take a minute or two. Exactly. So I think it's a brilliant initiative. It gives people that, that stopping gap and that breathing space to just present the card because people are trained in knowing what it is. Yeah. They're able to give them the time they need and they can go about their day. So I think it has a really positive knock on effect for everyone involved. Very good. And you're involved um, in other kind of co or associated campaigns. Mm. And I I saw that you, um, uh, you, you know, you're endorsing priority seating and and all of that. Tell us a little bit about some of those kind of associated areas where you're yeah. kind of fighting the good fight. <laughs> oh, always. Uh, yeah, like transport, like I was saying, it's such a massive part. So it's letting people know that the high priority area is for people with hidden disabilities. And I think it is so misleading. You look at the sign, it's a lady who's pregnant. It's a, per- it's an, you know, maybe an old man with a walking stick. Yeah. And, um, something else, you know, so you're looking at the sign, you're going, oh, that doesn't really f- represent me. And there is that guilt. And I've talked to a lot of people about the guilt of sitting down and then, you know, the old the old lady or, or man hobbles on the bus and yeah. you're kind of going, oh my goodness, I really need this seat. I'm in so much pain today. I really can't stand. And, and it is that inherent guilt that you feel and it's trying to say to people like you are just as deserving yeah. of that seat as someone else, mm. you know, and that's because of the way that 
it's structured the seating that you know in an ideal world everyone would have a seat but you know sometimes there isn't so it's making sure that you have enough accessible seating it's the same with them um, you know the prams and the, versus the wheelchairs, wheelchairs exactly. that's always a really big issue it was more so on the older buses I think now there's a lot more space yeah. but it's I've awful to pick yeah, one against another or whatever. Yeah, they're very yeah, they're yeah. the same but different. Yes, they have wheels, they have four wheels, but completely different, both deserving of the space. So it's about rearranging that space. And I think I've seen that a lot more with the newer New fleet. Buses, yeah, 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 you see that the green chairs, you see that there's more space. So I think we are becoming a little bit more aware and we are moving towards that, which is brilliant. Yeah. Um and in terms of kind of public um, etiquette, are there mm. other things that maybe people could could learn or you know in terms of transport etiquette yeah. generally I think or? Ireland is quite good we you know we say thank you to the bus driver yeah. we get off the bus and I think people are good at saying oh do you want my seat no you're all right thanks very much I think people are quite good but when it's wet and it's cold and it's dark and it's winter and you've had a long day at work the last thing you want to be doing is giving nobody's making co- eye contact and <laughs> yeah. keep those earphones in yeah, yeah so it's always just remembering that yeah if you can to offer the seat and that's why the badge and the card is so helpful because it's that hint and yeah. that you know I have a hidden condition would you mind and yeah people generally are very good once yeah. they know or exactly they, you know yeah and just in terms of other initiatives that you support your the the uh sunflower lanyard scheme and all of that and the uh, priority passes and seating at, at stadiums and things like that and mm-hmm. um, do you want to chat about about that or? yeah well first on the sunflower lanyard it's I always say it's just a hint it's mm. just a little helpful hint that this person has a hidden condition and it actually started off in an airport so ac- once again accessing transport yeah and um, it started off in an airport in the UK and it's been kind of brought over to Ireland so we're still quite slow on the rollout of it but it is there I've seen people in Ireland use it and the feedback is always really good so it won't fix everything and you know if I forget to wear my lanyard you know what can you do I I still have a hidden condition I just maybe can't outwardly show it so I think it's a great way of subtly showing to people that this is why maybe like like they're accessing a stadium they're accessing different seating or things because we were in Disneyland a few years ago me and my best friend and you know I can't stand in queues for long periods of time so we had a priority pass yeah And it is kind of funny when you would, you know, walk up to the queue and skip it and (laughs) other people are going, hang on a second, you know, and they're trying to... Getting irate. Yeah, you're kind of getting the looks. um, But maybe having the lanyard there, people might say, oh, okay. So it's just that subtle hint. And like, people think of it as a luxury, like, oh, you get front row seats at the stadium and you get to skip the queues in Disneyland, but... I I wouldn't be able to go and do these things and access these things at all if it wasn't for those. So I think it's always important to highlight while they're great and it's great to skip the queues and et cetera. I literally would not be able to to go and and access these things. So it's letting people know those resources are there if they need them um, and that it's okay to need them and use them. Absolutely. Yeah. And I mean, it's so interesting to think of, I suppose, the behavior of people in queues and crowds, like people can Mm. get very, unlike say maybe... As we were saying on a bus or a, yeah. a tram or whatever, people are open to helping maybe. But when, when as soon as you put people in a queue, yeah. <laughs> they get very cross if they... Yeah. Um, <laughs> so, and just in terms of, say, I saw that you were doing a lot of um, other campaigning around, you know, say during COVID, delays to um, procedures and all of that. Yeah. Like aside from public transport, what are the... What other areas are you campaigning for? I think health is a massive one. Mm -hmm. You know, I think every health service in in the world is is struggling with um, post-pandemic, the impacts that COVID has had. And then if you look at, you know, we all know the waiting list, the trolley crises that come and go, um, delays to surgery. I've definitely been there. So I think that's a massive thing because then, you know, if you're not accessing, say, a service early on Mm. when you can intervene, it's going to become worse. It ends up being more expensive. You need more intervention, more funding. So it's all about that early intervention, get, getting people into clinics or into hospital mm. when they need it, getting their surgeries and giving them the best quality of life. Yeah. Um, and I think that's something Ireland really struggles with is getting people into hospital on time, time, giving them that care they need and going home because I've been both having arthritis and a heart condition. It's kind of slow and fast. You know, I've been, it's tailor opposites where with rheumatology, you 
could be waiting months for an appointment and mm. you're kind of bottom of the rung yeah. versus being a heart patient where you're rushed into ambulance and you're the first person they see. Yeah. So I've experienced both ends so of, of that health care system. So does that tell you that, uh, you know, maybe pain management or maybe, you know, despite best yeah. intentions that, that, you know, the kind of pain management is oh chronic pain famous. chronic fatigue those conditions are definitely pushed pushed down pushed the end down, yeah. and it's really interesting the research that has come out that it's young women who are predominantly affected by misdiagnoses and gaslighting so conditions like fibromyalgia so pain conditions endometriosis endometriosis they predominantly affect women yeah and young women and so they often wait, it's something like six to 10 years is kind of the time frame they wait to get diagnosed. So there's massive issues there around chronic pain conditions mm -hmm. um, in young women, getting them diagnosed and, and getting them the help they need. And is there any research to suggest as to why that might be or why? I think it's a number of factors. There, there's no x-ray or blood test for fatigue or for pain, unfortunately. Yeah. So those conditions are a little bit harder to diagnose um, and therefore doctors, you know, when you're young and you're healthy, you're, you're a young woman and doctors are saying, there's nothing wrong with you. Yeah. Um, so I think there, there, there's a lot of factors, but those would be the, the main ones that I have seen. Um, but I think with more awareness, I think people are a lot more aware about these things and we're working towards them. You look at the big, you know, campaign on menopause that's been really big yeah. in the last few years. So I think things are slowly starting to come you know come, yeah. up, come up and get better so and I know that on um, the Lewis uh, Fingless extension that mm. we're doing we're doing an awful lot of work on uh, designing through a gender lens um, yeah. and traveling in a woman's shoes and all of that but I suppose you know looking at who's using the space and why mm. they might be using it and why they might not be using it initially kind of from safety point of view but then you're trying to kind of get a universality out of it. So a lot of what we're looking at on fingers would be resting places, you know, where you're walking up hills. And of course, it benefits everybody and just trying to make spaces usable by everybody, including maybe women who wouldn't be yeah. traditionally using them. Yeah, because um, I think I saw it was at South Korea. They have women only carriages on their underground. I thought that was really fascinating and yeah. they loved it. So it's it's interesting that you say that, that it's important to tailor and to change things up and to mix it around a bit. And, and at least be thinking about yeah. it and just see, seeing how we can. Exactly. Um, but in terms of, so I suppose what we're hoping to do with this podcast um, is to, I suppose, let people know about our light rail and mm -hmm. Metrolink and future projects, etc. But we're also hoping uh, that designers and decision makers within our own organization get to hear kind of a diverse range of stories and then that'll feed into their, their design. And, yeah. Uh, so from your point of view, what could what could transport designers or even you know engineers, et cetera, learn from from your group and from you? Yeah, I think. I, I love the phrase, it's nothing about us without us. Yeah. I love that because like that, there's no point designing a transport system and, you know, saying it's for people with disabilities and then suddenly you realise that the ramp is, isn't high enough for someone with a wheelchair to get on and then there's not enough accessible seats. So I think it's so important to listen to a variety of people. So it's it's great to be here and to share my experiences and it's great just to see people listening. I think that's the most powerful thing you can do sometimes is to just listen to other people and, and see how you can help. Um, so for me, it's just all about it being accessible. So, you know, when I had to get two buses, it was I was able to get off my first bus. Mm -hmm. I was able to walk a relatively short distance from my joints. I was able to wait, you know, a few minutes. There was a seat there if I needed it. Yeah. I was able to get on the second bus. You know, it wasn't full. I could have a seat. Um, I could put in my earphones, especially for people um, with ASD, with autism. They might find a bus a very overwhelming, overstimulating mm -hmm. place. So it's doing all of those things, having the announcements. I remember speaking to the NTA for people who are visually impaired, having the yellow railings. You know, we've done... There's so many things that are hidden in the design that you wouldn't know is accessible, but it's there for people. So yeah. I think it's still continuing down that road because it's like we were saying earlier, there's great work done, but there's always more to more do. To do. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And like you say, just good interchange. You know, you don't want mm -hmm. to get off one and have to walk miles around the corner yeah, and then exactly. have a long wait and, you know. Yeah. Uh, because even going into St. James's today, I know one of the main reasons they built the National Children's Hospital was because it was the Lewis and light rail yeah, yeah. and having access to transport so it really does underpin how we use 
our world, how we use everything around us. So it's definitely so important. And I think absolutely it's, it's come a long way. It's brilliant. So you were saying earlier, um, Emily, that you started the uh, a campaign, basically you put it together as part of a Gashka yeah. um, thing. So you were still at school. Mm-hmm. I was, well, I was in college. I was 19. 19, so okay. So it was the gold Gashka. So there was oh, the bronze, the, the silver, and then the gold. Very yeah. good, yeah. And um, I see that from your website as well, you've done an awful lot of uh, interviews around mm. um, the International Day of Persons with Disabilities. And is there a, a Hidden Disabilities Week? Did I see that? Or? Yeah, that's in October. Yeah. Yeah. So it's great to have the separate week as well as the day celebrating it together for all people with disabilities. Um, it's nice to have the two just to raise awareness. Raise awareness, especially when yeah. maybe it's currently so unknown or, you know, that people yeah, are only just exactly. building to. And, and how did that go? Was that something that you established yourself the week the, or is it an international? So we have that week from America. That was where that stems from. So they set the date every year and I just follow Polish. along yeah, yeah. <laughs> with it. So it's generally, I think it was the 18th and 24th or something this year. So it's great to have kind of a global week set aside for us to campaign on. Yeah. And the messaging is always so clear because it's Invisible Disability Week. Um, and it was really special having people share their stories um, on our social media this year. And the, the theme was Believe Me, See Me. Yeah. I think that's really important. Like we we're talking about earlier, where young women in particular are very vulnerable and doctors believing them and their pain. Mm. Um, and it can be very hard for people to look at someone when they say they're in chronic pain and to say, well, you look fine. Yeah. You know, you look healthy, you look well. So it's all about seeing beyond that and believing them. Yeah. So I thought that was something that was really good to very do. Very good. Emily, you were chatting about um, the organisation itself. Mm-hmm. Maybe if you'd like to just go into a little bit about your own background and uh, uh, how how that led you to set up Invisible Disability Ireland. Yeah, so I was originally diagnosed with rheumatoid arthritis when I was 13 years old. Um, so it happened quite quickly. Um, I became quite unwell and then developed kind of aches and pains mm-hmm. and then the journey to a diagnosis began. Um, and then over the years, you know, I developed complications. Naturally, I developed fibromyalgia, a condition of my muscles. I have a connective tissue disease and I have a stomach condition. And then I have three heart conditions um, for good measure. So obviously over the years, I've kind of gotten uh, sicker. And mm-hmm. so that's ki- that kind of led me to set up the organization because there was charities that represented my heart condition and, you know, arthritis and stuff like that. But there was nothing that represented everything yeah. and what it actually meant to live with multiple chronic illnesses and disabilities and especially ones that were hidden so that's kind of where I felt the need for the organization in society and that was why I set it up. And you were saying when we were chatting earlier that initially you were reluctant nearly yeah yeah oh yeah I think anyone's reluctant to open up about such a vulnerable part of your life Mm -hmm. and especially when I was so young Um, but I think over the years I grew more confident in myself and my abilities and who I was as a person and so I understood like I was saying how important it was to advocate and to share my stories Mm -hmm. because it it was so important for other people to learn and understand about it so now I'm very open about it uh, but I wasn't always and People prefer different things. Some people don't like to talk about it and some people do. And, yeah. and that's okay. So, yeah. Very good. And you're now a um, primary school teacher? Yeah. Um, and just in terms of the kind of uh, the work that you're doing, both as a teacher mm-hmm. and uh, with um, Invisible Disability Ireland, is there an overlap are you seeing with some of the kids that you're teaching? Is, is there kind of a crossover relevance? I'm sure there is. Yeah, I mean, every class has disability. Um, mm-hmm. I think it's it's so common, like I was saying earlier, um, one in seven. So that's at least three children in your class, yeah. at minimum, will have a disability. Uh, and I'm very lucky to have children with disabilities and to learn from them and to watch them and to encourage them. So it's been a great learning experience for me to see disability in a different perspective yeah. in an educational context. So it's it's been it's been really great yeah and are you finding that the kind of uh, school supports are just gradually improving over the years that people again through awareness maybe that the, the kind of um teaching culture is just much more supportive maybe of, yeah. of diverse kids 
I think that's the two biggest things, awareness and funding. Yeah. <laughs> you know, um, but I think, yeah, it's like anything, it's massively improved and it still has some way to go. But I think kids definitely are in a much better position than they were even 10 years ago. Yeah. So I think it's constantly improving and changing, which is brilliant. No, thanks to people like yourselves. <laughs> Um, Emily, it's been an absolute pleasure and thank you so much for your time um, and it's been great to talk to you and keep up the fantastic work. Thank you. Thank you. We're joined now by Emer Dennehy, archaeologist with TII. So, Emer, you're very welcome to All Aboard TII's Accessibility Podcast. Now, Emer, when the podcast team put out a call out to staff to participate in this podcast, you responded to say that you'd like to talk about um, your experiences following a car accident. And I initially thought that that would make an interesting item on temporary disability. But as I've discovered from talking to you since, the fallout from your accident has been much more long lasting, really. And it's probably more accurate to say that you're, or even to look at your experience in the light of hidden disability. So maybe if you just start by telling us about the circumstances of your accident, when it happened, how it happened, etc. Yeah, well, thanks a million for having me and thanks for organising this because I think it's quite a useful podcast and I hope, I suppose, disability, would I classify it? You know, maybe some people look, oh, she's just um, a long-suffering, you know, human. But um, I suppose what happened was, well, at the Christmas party, if we go way back at the Christmas party 2008, I actually broke my foot um, mm -hmm. it snapped dancing and I thought, oh my God, I thought this is the worst thing. I genuinely thought that was the worst thing ever that could possibly happen to me. And two days before the cast was due to come off, we were driving on the M50 and there'd been recent roadworks and they were constructing, do, doing the new Red Cow roundabout um, construction works. And as we came up along the Lewis, um, a gantry um, collapsed on top of the car, and tore the car in half. Yeah. It's fairly dramatic. Tragic, yeah. 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 And um walked out of it, got up, dust my well, I was on my crutches <laughs> and I got out of the car and then um the road was blocked and they made me sit in the car for two over two hours, which was mentally not the best thing that could you ever do to someone. Mm. And initially just thought I was fine and then the pains just started and my legs started swelling and obviously I was due to get my cast off the next day in the hospital anyway as it was and it, they couldn't find out what was being wheeled around from room to room and it turned out that I had um, the cast the impact of it had crushed my heel crushed my ankle I had horrendous horrendous whiplash like you know which just got worse and worse and mm -hmm. it turned out that the whiplash had um, and you know people say oh whiplash and see people going around with their collars but whiplash is actually quite serious if you have it like you know and yeah. I know a lot of people take advantage of it but it caused quite a lot of damage for me it damaged all my spine damage down into my hips, it damaged my hips, I have bone growths on my um, vertebrae now, I have lost all feeling in my fingers, well not all feeling, like 70% of the feeling in some of my fingers, lost feeling in my toes mm. and that was like, that was 17th of January 2009 and we're now, what are we now? 2022. Two, and still in physio, still in treatments, like, you know. So yeah. a, a long and painful recovery which yeah. is still ongoing. Yeah. And so... How does that affect your day to day living? You know, mm. in terms of you mentioned you have a dog, for example. Yeah, and just three dogs. Yeah. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Way too many dogs. Yeah, well, initially it was extremely difficult, as I was saying to you earlier. Um, initially, I couldn't live by myself, couldn't wash myself, couldn't walk properly, couldn't take care of the dog. I didn't see my dog for months, couldn't drive, couldn't travel, couldn't. Mm. Couldn't, couldn't do anything like and you're just going around in this days of not knowing what's wrong with you when is it and you think as well oh my god just a few physio sessions now I'll be fine like this pain will get better but for the it was three years of really really intense her really bad pain like you know mm. like it was three years before I could sleep in the bed without a pillow to prop my foot up mm. I used to pray for my leg to be amputated I just could not bear the pain mm. it was just and that was just the pain in my leg. Yeah. Then I had all the back pain and the chest pain and 
And the pain, just the pain is just, I suppose, now just left with chronic pain, which, as I said, isn't bad. Um, it, the chronic is just means it's long term, but I have not known a day without pain since yeah. since it happened. And then, as I said to you, you get like, you, you think it's all going well. And then I break another bone and because I, I, because I don't have very much muscle in my feet left. I have a lot of muscle wastage, a lot of muscle damage. Mm. And um, my toes break all the time. So I'm constantly breaking my toes and I'm actually breaking my fingers as well. And there's a problem with that because I don't feel my fingers very well. Anytime I do damage, I have to go and get it checked out because I actually don't know how much damage I've really done. Like, you mm. know, and so, um, so yeah, so, so I'm constantly um, in physio, like what, what what they say is now it's a maintenance phase. Like, you know, people are surprised you'd see you up and walking, but they might see you then limping, particularly on a cold day or if I've done too much walking or sat in the wrong kind of a chair. And they don't realise that I'm still kind of living in in, in this. And, and compared to what it was, like the pain is is nothing. Yeah. Like, you know, it genuinely isn't. But I've never known a day without pain. And that's that can be quite tough at times. Like, and particularly then when you do break something and you're just like, oh, my God, I thought I was getting better. And mm. then I'm back. But, you know, but they, the, I've kind of come to learn now, like, you know, this happened before you've had your setback. Just just sit down, take a break and then tomorrow get up again and yeah. move forward. And, and you will move forward and, yeah. and you will recover and you'll get back to where you were. But I suppose for me, walking can be quite difficult. And when it's taken away from you. Um, even just for for a month or two, it's like oh, I'm here again. I'm and you might as well be back sitting in the car sometimes yeah. inside the wreck of the car, like thinking, God, this yeah. thought ahead of me again. Like, exactly. You know? And as you were saying, just I mean, even the fact of the, the kind of violence of the accident, almost that you were in counselling and still oh, are, and yeah, just to try and come to terms with the the injuries, but also the experience. Yeah, and the mental. I, I think as well, like you know. People think, oh, you know, it's the hidden illness. It's it's a mental health illness. It's people always say, oh God, you know, your health is your wealth. And I'm like, well, your mental health is an absolute fortune because when that goes, yeah, it's gone. So I did, I did. Um, unfortunately, because I was left sitting in the car, they took my crutches off me and they left me sit there, and the wind was still blowing, and I thought, oh my God got to die here you know and mm. and so I did develop a um, post-traumatic stress disorder and I've been dealing with that constantly and and with the post-traumatic stress disorder and with the injuries you're never recovered you're in what they call these main a maintenance phase mm. so you're as good as they're going to get you you'll never be perfect mm. but I have a good quality of life now most of the days you yeah. know 95% of the time is a good quality of life despite everything else but just then you just have to be always kind of watching watching the signs of your physical you know, oh, if I walk a bit further now, I'm going to actually do damage. Stop. Don't push yourself. Take a day off tomorrow. Yeah. And then the same for your mental health. Just, you know, you're getting a bit stressed out. Just just go and, and, and talk to your, to, to your professional and get a bit of help and get a bit of perspective. And, and honest to God, sometimes you go in and you think, God, how am I going to do? And the weight of the world comes off your shoulders yeah. when you've talked. Talking to someone, talk to anybody will, will help you yeah. cope with what you have to cope that's with. You know, yeah, it? yeah. And just in terms of your, I mean, your role in TI, is as a, an archaeologist and <sighs> plenty of experience and that involves a lot of site work yeah. a lot of climbing into cellars and old buildings and up and down stairs so. yeah and across a lot of uneven surfaces and god knows when you we didn't have the lewis you know lewis cross city you're going out building it and, and it was the same when you'd be working on a road you're like god this place really needs a lewis this place really needs a road because they're hard to get to there's a lot of walking the steel toe caps are incredibly uncomfortable that's for the me steel toe caps of your or ppe your site gear yeah, yeah and even like on a bad day like on a bad day now the hard hat weighs a lot because because my neck is sore yeah. and even the tags from hanging you know your ID tags they can actually cause quite a lot of discomfort and pain and people don't realise that but walking on site and on even surfaces and going across fields and hopping ditches and I remember doing a job here and like thank God for the for the guys I work with they're so understanding I could get one leg over the gate but I couldn't get the other leg okay, over the yeah. gate and the lad's trying to push me over down in Carrick Mines Park and ride trying to get me onto site like you know and, Very good. and like yeah it, it has it does cause me a lot of worry and a little bit of stress I'm like God I have to walk all that way will my foot be good will my foot be bad mm. will I be able to make it will I get a taxi what will I do like yeah, you know bit, plenty of planning yeah and you were saying that the you have had a fair bit of support from from TII but say for other people in a similar situation what kind of support do you think employers or colleagues could give well, um, you know, I, I'm going to say this because I also suffer quite a bit from migraines as well. Like, you know, mm. and people don't realise how debilitating migraines can be too. Like, you know, so you kind of have a double whammy. So I do think like, um, and I'm very blessed. I have really great colleagues 
really understanding um, support from colleagues and from my manager. But I do think you kind of need to take a bit of cognizance of the fact that, you know, sometimes you're, you're asking someone to do something and what you're actually asking them to do is way more way more than you'd ever anticipate. And I've said it to my manager lately and he said, God, I never thought, I said, you don't have to live in my head. You don't have to realize that what you're asking me to, to go down and look at that site, like I actually have to build myself up quite a bit. Now, some days I take no notice, but mm. if I'm having a bad day and I'm hurting, I have to build myself up to going out on site. And, and I do think you kind of need to maybe like sit down when you're asking someone to do something and just say, are you able to do that today? Yeah. Or would you like to do it tomorrow? You know, because when you can't do your job, like, and a job that I'm very passionate about, like, mm -hmm. I love working on construction sites. I love everyone I work with and I love building the Lewis or the metros as they go on. But I don't want to, I don't want to be put under so much pressure that it's going to come to the point where I actually won't be able to do my job. Like, you know, yeah. and I don't think this, that will happen here. Mm -hmm. But I do think that you, people and employers need to be a bit conscious of, of, of how much stress something simple is actually putting under some uh, putting pressure under and someone. Particularly like, you know? maybe where it's it's yeah. more hidden. It's not an obvious uh, disability or not yeah. an obvious. Yeah, because there'd be a day when I could run down the road, like, you know, and you'd be like, what's her problem? Like, you yeah, know, yeah. and then there'd be a wet day and a cold day and it's gone into my hip and it's gone into my leg. And I'm like, oh, I just can barely make it to the office, you know, and, yeah. and sitting here and just this is just the pain is getting worse. So and sometimes as well, like that's why I think the advantage of COVID and working from home is that, you know, maybe that person can do a full day's work if you don't ask them to come into the office. Yeah. But if you ask them to come into the office and do that commute, you're actually putting so much pressure on them. It's going to be the point where they're actually going to have to phone out sick, which makes them feel like a lesser person, like, you yeah. know, because it's not that you, I don't have anything to contribute to society. It's not that I can't do my job, but putting me under pressure to commute yeah. If I don't need to commute, if I'm having a bad day, I think things like that will actually help people an so, awful lot. Like, and a good yeah. communication and a little bit of understanding and maybe not to to be able to kind of see past the kind of yeah. um, obvious. And I think to be fair as well, like I don't want to take advantage of it. I don't want to use it as an excuse not to come in. Yeah. Because when I'm able to come in, I should come in, like, you know. Yeah. yeah. And just on that, you were saying that you generally for getting around, I mean, you, 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 would use public transport and like what kind of barriers do you encounter when you're traveling day to day? Yeah, well, like at the minute I am suffering. I'm on a bit of a setback at the minute. So my hip isn't working very well. So the stairs are extremely difficult for me at the minute. Mm. Sorry. Um, yeah, really struggling with stairs. Mm. And first off, I don't like people then judging me when I'm getting the lift. Like a lift is there for a reason. <laughs> I'm course, having a bad day. Yeah. Don't judge people just because they're getting a lift for a flight of stairs. You don't know what's going on or, or why they need it. But for me, like then, as I said to you, and I've discussed with you, those ramps and this train station, because I commute by train, um, I, I drive to the halfway to the train station and walk a little bit. And then trying to get over the platforms, you know, it can be quite like, oh, the, the flight of stairs just feels so big. Yeah. But then the ramps are so long, oh, like, well. you know, yeah. and if the ramps are anyway uneven, if there's any imperfection, because my, my foot has been so damaged that they've, they've advised me that my brain actually doesn't recognize fully where my foot is. Yeah. So I have a tendency to trip and the bottom of my foot will drag on the footpath. You'll see, oh my God, what's wrong with this one? She's not walking. But it's because my, 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 my brain just cannot judge the distance between the foot and the ground. So I hit it, the ground quite a bit. So if there's any unevenness yeah. in the ramps, it becomes quite like it's a quite a trip hazard, like, you yeah. know, and I remember when I was on crutches and I was just I was living in an apartment block. And again, there was another ramp and just fallen because I just it just wasn't even. It was just that little bit of unevenness and, and just couldn't couldn't keep your balance going. So mm -hmm. so things like that um, and the ramps are just so long and. I don't know how much physical strength I think you have. But like when when I was really bad at the start, like and my back was so bad, I was on crutches for my foot and I could I was trying to get myself around on crutches and my back was so bad. And then the ramps were so long and you're just like, God, has anyone who designed this sat in a wheelchair and seen how much energy or put on your crutches that it actually takes to get up? this long distance of a ramp. And when I first started as well, my train station in Kildare, when I was able to move home and take care of myself again, didn't even have that. It was just a flight of stairs and you'd have to get taxis because I couldn't drive and get a taxi up 
And then um, the station master would have to come and open a special gate for me and I'd have to book it or phone him on the way and say, I'm in the taxi now, can you please come and open the gate? Because mm. it was the only way I could get onto the right side of the platform yeah. to, to access works. And, and then you get on the train. And I'm going to say as well, like the one thing I have realised is there's always someone worse off. There's always someone with a worse case. And the train that I take going up to Kildare is actually the train that a lot of cancer patients take coming up and down to, to their hospital in James's. Yeah. And you'd be standing. And I remember one day saying to a lady, and now I was in agony standing, and she was on her way up for chemotherapy, like, you mm. know. And, and again, nobody noticed. Nobody saw that the, us two women were down the back nearly in tears. She she gone for chemo and me just like in absolute agony with my foot, like, you know. Yeah. And people just don't realise that. Like, and, and I said to you before, there was a day and the disabled chair was was free. Do you know the, the, the you know, for the designated space, space yeah. like, and I sat in it. And like we were between stations, so nobody was coming. And a woman actually gave out to me. And I was like, you've no idea how bad a day I have just had. I'm really in pain here. I just want to sit down for five minutes mm. and you're having a go with me, you yeah. know? And like, I'm sure there's people who take advantage of the stairs. I'm sure there is. But, you know, I've had people on the Lewis trying to take the Lewis, you know, and not getting up off their seats. Kids just taking, you know, with their feet on the chairs. And you're like, I could really do with that seat. Like, I really, yeah. really could. So a bit of consideration and not jumping to conclusions, I suppose, when you see somebody who looks... Yeah, able bodied or whatever. Yeah, and you just you just don't know like how yeah. much physical pain and and you'll see me sometimes I might like I'd be middle of walking and then I actually have to stop and I have to rearrange my whole posture to try and get myself walking again. Like you know, yeah. and like people are going through and that's just me and like I'm mild now in comparison when I'm nothing in comparison to what I was. Yeah, and then you were talking about trying to get around even on crutches and the kind of difficulties with, yeah. um, you know. Yeah, um, <laughs> the day, yes, I, I did have to cross from, um, again, I wasn't living in my own house. I was living in an apartment in Dublin and I got in on the platform at Houston and I had to cross over and my crutch got stuck in the track of the Lewis and the Lewis was coming and I said, of all the people to get a crutch stuck as an employee now who works on the Lewis, I could not wiggle my crutch out of the track yeah, cap. Yeah. Like, you know, I said, this is it. This is so embarrassing. But we really have happened like yeah. you know and and like the other thing is when you're on crutches and you're trying to manage everything in your bag and you need to have hoods because you can't carry umbrellas you and then you're trying to push the buttons you're trying to ma- maneuver and push the buttons to get the doors open so I got into the habit of saying to people would you mind opening the door or pushing the button for me there like, yeah you know simple things like that and I think don't be afraid to ask you know um you know would you just like little things like push the button makes a huge difference because it means you don't have to rearrange yourself and yeah. things like that like you know and and maybe if you're standing at the door as well just automatically I would try now just just automatically open the doors because you never know what else someone else is, is going through like you yeah, know yeah. and even for you know women with prams and not even people in wheelchairs I've seen people in wheelchairs I've been in a wheelchair myself Trying to, to reach things, it's really difficult. Like, you know, yeah. so just like look press around the and press the and button. You're like, standing two there. seconds, yeah. like, yeah. you know, so yeah. yeah. And what about other, I mean, what have you found in terms of real recovery? What have you found that has helped physically, mentally, et cetera, that would, um, that maybe might be of use to people? Well, great physiotherapies. Um, I used to have two hours. People, I don't think, realised that I used to be in two hours of physio a week. It mm. was quite tough. So a great physiotherapist, a really strong physiotherapist, because, God, they, they learn their money when they're dealing with someone like me. Um, Pilates. Now, everyone sees me here running after Pilates and think, oh, God, that one must be so into health. I hate it. Mm. With an absolute passion. I absolutely hate it. But Pilates is a, is a great, um, you asked me before about pain management. Pilates is a huge pain management technique for mm-hmm. me and when I initially was bad it would be, give me maybe one or two days of relief now I could get maybe a week a week and a half of relief out of Pilates so that's huge and it was actually a former manager got me into counselling as well like you know um, and if that person would I be here today I don't know if that person hadn't gotten me into counselling because yeah. I didn't know what was going on I didn't yeah. know why I was waking up screaming you yeah. know I had no idea idea mm. you you see these things um and people always say to me oh you must you, you have flashbacks to the accident I said no I have horrendous nightmares absolutely horrendous but I never ever not once have have had a a dream about my um about my accidents it's been other issues um I have an awful lot of fear of being trapped I have a, a desperate fear of being trapped mm. um because I was trapped in yeah. the car 
And they took my crutches off me, which I'm really bitter about, yeah. like, you know, because because then I couldn't get out of the car, even though I've, the doors would open and, and, and I, I just couldn't get out of the car. So I just think like these small things like, you know, um, maybe as well, you know, sometimes you might see someone panicking in, a, in a, um, an elevator. I know it's happened to me in the past, panicking mm. in a small space, like, you know, there might be something underlying that. And I do think like I talk quite openly about my mental health because somebody took the time to sit me down and get me in to help. And maybe me just talking about it might actually help somebody else. Because when you're going around and, you, and you're in this blur and this haze and you don't know what's wrong with you and you're in so much pain and you're just, it, it gives you the, it gives you a life coaching technique mm. of how, to, and the best one I ever got was to change the channel. It was a, it was a technique my counsellor taught me. Like every time you're having a flashback, mm. just pretend you're pressing remote control, mm. changing the channel, think about something else. And and it'll get your mind off it. So so it is. And even if it's down to pain management, again, it was my counsellor who said it to me. How do you expect to get through your day if you're not actually taking the painkillers? You know, if you're not doing what the doctors have told you to do. So I, I do think everybody, everybody in any walk of life and any issue needs to talk to someone and yeah. be open. And, and because just relieving that pressure. And finding gives you those coping mechanisms. I was just going to say that it gives you the, te- the the strength to find the other coping mechanisms, gives you the strength. Like the last thing I was given out in my, my last counselling session and his final words were, do your Pilates. <laughs> like, you, yeah. know, you know, I hate it. <laughs> like, you know, but it will help. But it will help yeah, like, yeah. 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 So, um, so that's, that's, and and I think, you know, having a job you love and like, you know, we, we all, I know we're old RPA and but RPA was the time that things were bad for me. And my colleagues really, really stood by me mm. and really helped. And there'd be days when you just be doom and gloom. And they put a smile on your face. And, and like they've been good to me. There's been days I haven't been able to tie my shoes. Yeah. And, and my colleagues have actually bent down and tied my shoes for me, for carried them. my books for me yeah. and helped me. And, and, and that's what's and going out on site and just construction sites are great to, for a laugh and a great for a, a mental health break as well like you know yeah. and, and and the guys just really helped me in that regard like you know yeah just fantastic yeah. to hear that and I'm sure they'll be glad to hear yeah you know. no yeah really have helped yeah. me you know so I mean when we were chatting earlier you said that uh your old life vanished on the day yeah. of the accident and that you had to come to terms with an entirely new life which is kind of a pretty profound readjustment um so I mean, I know you feel that difficult and all as it has been, that it's been an incredible learning experience. It's opened your eyes to other things. and Yeah, like I, I, what I say is that somebody got out of the car. It just wasn't me anymore. Yeah. And even actually on the day I got out of the car, someone ran over and a man and he held me and he said, it's all right now, love. Mm. It's all right now. And I will never forget yeah. that man. I don't know who he is or who he was, mm. but I've always said it has been the absolute kindness of strangers. And I used to cry and I used to say, where's my life back? I, want, I just want my life back. And I had to come to terms and say, it's never coming back. Mm. But it has been great as much as it's been bad. It has been great. Like going to physio every two, twice a week every night I actually started meeting people I would say to my friend I would say would you meet me after physio mm. and I started actually becoming a lot more social um if you kind of say to me now oh you can't do that I'm like mm, uh, is that a challenge yeah <laughs> like, you know and like there's many things like I've said to you I know I have a list of things I actually it was another counseling ticket is do a list of all the things you've achieved and when you sat down and like I still have that list it was like god the day I was able to dress the bed myself the day I was able to get dressed myself the day I was able to wash myself yeah the day I was able to move home all these targets and it's not like I was in hospital I just physically could not take care of myself like yeah. you know so all these little targets that were set for yourself and I still do that I still set all these targets and like I've climbed Machu Picchu I would love to do the Camino mm. and I just have to do it in a different way, way you know and 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 just don't let it stop you but if you don't get the help that you need mm. you're the only person you're stopping is you're stopping yourself yeah I'm not like Pollyanna. I don't see the good in everything. I'm, I still get quite bitter, yep. you know, but but there is good in life and yep. and, 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 the po- and I have gotten a lot of positives out of it. I, I, could I go back and say no? no. <laughs> and I suppose the big message really for people is just, you know, there are hidden disabilities out there and just cut people a break if you even think of it, you know. Yeah. You, yep. You just really do not know what is going on inside someone's head that day or how like there genuinely are days when just putting one foot in front of the other is so hard and Mm. you just want to give up. I can't give up. No, 
and I won't give up. <laughs> Good for <laughs> so, you, Emer. Um, thank you so much for coming along and talking to us so candidly about your accident and all of the fallout from it. And uh, I hope it'll be of help to people who are listening. All right. Thanks a minute for thank having you, me. Emer. Thanks for organising this. Really appreciate Fantastic. it. So that's it for this episode. We hope you enjoyed hearing from Emily and Emer and their experiences of living and traveling with a hidden disability. You can find out more about Emily's work at invisibledisabilityireland.com. We will link to the website in our episode notes. Thank you to our host, Sarah O'Donnell, to Trevor Cudden on sound, to the production team, Kathleen Jacobi, Rachel Cahill and Claire Scott, to Sinead Foley from TU Dublin, who designed our fantastic graphics and to everyone else who helped make this podcast. Please send us your comments and feedback to allaboard at tii.ie. And for more episodes from All Aboard, please go to Spotify, iTunes, or wherever you get your podcasts. Until next time.